invitation to visit virtually in Paris. Uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to visit uh, in person sometimes sooner rather than later. Um, so uh, as Adam said, the, the title of this talk is The Hidden Geometry of Particle Collisions. And uh, behind the scenes, just so you know, um, there's gonna be uh, aspects of artificial intelligence and that may not be obvious from this talk, um, but uh, let me just use this as an opportunity to advertise a new artificial intelligence institute that we've launched in the Boston area, uh, the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions that we pronounce as uh, iFi. And you can see from the iFi logo, uh, you can either read that as a capital A with a lowercase i on top of it for artificial intelligence or a capital F next to a capital I for fundamental in interactions. And we really see these as flip sides of the same coin. And so the goal of this institute is to advance physics knowledge from the smallest building blocks of nature to the largest structures in the universe and galvanize AI research innovation and uh, as, as I mentioned, the techniques that I'm gonna be telling you about today actually have their roots in some of the kind of foundational artificial intelligence ideas uh, that come from the computer vision community. So you'll see where that uh, uh, enters in, in uh, a bit later in this talk. So uh, the title of my talk is The Hidden Geometry of Particle Collisions. So let me just remind you about the manifest geometry of one collision. So when we slam together particles at the LHC, uh, we get sprays of particles. Uh, uh, in particular here, you see a beautiful example of jet production. And uh, we're used to geometries and we're used to symmetries when it comes to one collision. So uh, we're used to having symmetries like longitudinal boost invariance or azimuthal symmetry around the beam axis. We're used to using various geometric data processing techniques like jet clustering or topological structures like jet substructure. Um, and this is not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the geometry uh, of, of collisions. Here, I'm not talking about this kind of manifest geometry. I'm really talking about a more emergent geometry. Um, and so to try to give you a, a visualization of this, somehow we're gonna be taking this, uh, this geometry that you're familiar with and mapping it onto something that you're less familiar with. And so this is a attempt at taking a, uh, a complex fractal dimensional space and try to project it down onto two dimensions. Um, and this is actually using uh, data from the CMS experiment. Uh, they release public data sets. And this is taking 30,000 jets from that public data set and arranging those 30,000 jets in a way that has some geometric structure to it. It's very difficult to make a plot of all 30,000 jets. So I've just highlighted 25 jets in particular, um, which are centered on top of where they are in this kind of gray blob. So this gray blob is 30,000 jets. These uh, jets sprinkled on top of them are representative jets. And if you're interested in the Q&A, I can try to explain to you um, uh, exactly how those jets are chosen and what the, uh, the data science is behind that. Um, but if I were giving a, a different talk, I could try to explain to you more about this emergent geometry uh, and how, for example, in this case, uh, this two-dimensional projection actually projects down to the uh, two coordinates that govern uh, alterelli parisi splitting um, in particular, an energy sharing variable and an opening angle variable uh, that are the two primary coordinates that are involved in uh, the fragmentation of, of quarks and gluons. Um, and again, I could give you a whole uh, talk about this and I'll give you a little bit of, uh, uh, later on. Um, but this emergent geometric picture has been one that has been really helpful for us to see collider physics in a new light. Um, so the talk I'm gonna be giving today, uh, I'm calling it the hidden geometry of particle collisions, hidden because it's actually been here with us uh, for uh, you know, roughly a half century. And this emergent geometry, again, I'll explain it a little bit later, but what we've realized is that this emergent geometry actually connects to ideas uh, that have been present in, uh, in QCD for, for quite a while. Um, so this is work with uh, my graduate students, Patrick Kamitsky and Eric Matodia. And here's a summary roughly of where we're gonna, we're gonna be going in this talk. I'm gonna to try to explain to you how an individual collider event, in this case, it's an electron positron collision event from, uh, from the Aleph detector, can be mapped into a single point in this abstract space. This abstract space is what I showed you on the previous slide where, with that gray blob, uh, but here I'm just gonna take one event and map it to a point in this abstract space. In this abstract space, there's gonna be all sorts of geometric objects that we can study. In particular, we can study manifolds and uh, we can study distances of closest approach, for example, of a point, this event, to this manifold. And it turns out that this type of structure, this type of construction, uh, is related to ideas uh, in QCD event shapes going back to the 1960s and 1970s, but now reinterpreted in a geometric a language that I'm going to be explaining to you today. And the kind of punchline of this whole story that you're gonna be hearing uh, 
is that we can translate six decades of collider physics into a new geometric language. And I'll try to explain a little bit about all these cartoons uh, throughout this talk. Um, but that this geometry that comes from the artificial intelligence community, comes from the data science community, turns out to be one that we've been living with uh, for quite a while in jet physics uh, in QCD. And in particular notions like infrared and collider safety, event shapes, jet algorithms, jet substructure, even techniques like pilot mitigation, turn out to be easier to understand through this geometric language. And that's what I'm trying to explain to you in this, in this talk today. Okay, so that was uh, kind of going very quickly about what we're gonna do in this talk. So let me back up and go a little bit more slowly. And what I'm gonna be doing here is I'm going to try to explain step-by-step step what gets you to this geometric structure. So I'm going to first remind you what a collider event is. Um, and here it's gonna be what a collider event is from a more data science-y perspective. What are the data structures that we deal with when we talk about collider physics? And then answer a question that we don't usually ask in collider physics, uh, when are events similar? Typically what we do is we take events and we throw them into histograms, but we don't typically do pairwise comparisons of events. Um, and I'll try to explain to you why that pairwise comparison is interesting and why that gives rise to a notion of a geometry that we can study. And then um, uh, I'll try to explain all sorts of things that can be geometrized and how those geometric constructions connect to ideas that we've had in collider physics uh, in, in the past, and then try to give you a little bit of a sense of, a, of, a, of an arrow towards the future of what we can do with these geometric ideas. Um, and so uh, we're, we're here virtually, but uh, please uh, interrupt me or drop questions in the chat. I'll try to answer them um, as I go. And uh, I, I don't usually uh, tell you the number of slides that I have in a talk, but here uh, there, there's 50 slides in this talk. And the reason why I'm putting this here is because you might think that the talk is done uh, you know, around slide 40, but there'll be a, a, a coda at, at the end. So there's kind of a, an extra new thing that I want to make sure that, that you're, you're anticipating. So that's why I'm giving you the number of slides uh, in the corner here. Okay, so um, again, interrupt me, drop questions in the chat uh, as things come up. I assume there's no questions at the moment, um, but uh, if there are, uh, feel free to interrupt. Okay, so let's start with the, the, the first part of this, which is what is a collider event? Um, so uh, as, as we know, um, at colliders like the Large Hadron Collider, we get collisions happening, let's say every 25 nanoseconds, giving rise to the spray of particles that we need to re reconstruct. And there's all sorts of fascinating complications about how one tells what type of particles one has made. Um, but from a data science -y perspective, all a collider event is, is a collection of points in momentum space. Um, so if we ignore the fact that we can have displaced vertices, all the particles start from the origin and they go out with their momentum in the px, py, and pc direction. They also could carry energy or mass information. Um, and what we want to do is we want to uh, take advantage of this particular data structure and ask what data analysis techniques are available to us to study these collections of points in momentum space. Now, it turns out that trying to understand collections of points in momentum space uh, is complicated. Um, and it's complicated because this is not typically the information that I know how to calculate from a theory perspective. So let me just remind you about that. So when we have these, uh, sorry, these collimated sprays of particles, uh, which are called jets, uh, when I uh, form those jets, these jets form through a complicated generative process where at short distances, I start off with quarks and gluons. Those shower and radiate to generate more quarks and gluons. Eventually the strong force confines, so I get composite hadrons. Those composite hadrons hit your detector, which adds to additional complications. And trying to predict this whole chain of jet formation is complicated from the theoretical perspective, and in particular something that I don't know how to do uh, at the level of perturbative Feynman diagrams. If I ask what information about jet formation, what information about these collection of points can I actually predict from, from first principles, typically the thing that we have most access to theoretically is the flow of energy from the collision point off to infinity. So you can think about this as kind of like an idealized calorimeter uh, that's measuring this flow. Uh, you can think about this in a more uh, formal quantum mechanical language as uh, the energy flow tensor uh, uh, or the stress energy flow tensor. Uh, in particular, we have the stress tensor T mu nu. We take the zero component, that's the energy, the I component, that's the flow off to infinity. And this flow of energy off to infinity is information that's robust to hadronization and detector effects. It's well-defined for massless gauge theories. And this is the information that I'm gonna be trying to build my data analysis strategy around. 
This idea of energy flow uh, uh, has a, a long history uh, in, in QCD, kind of more formalized um, in the 1990s by Katchoff, kind of made more popular recently by Hoffman and Maldesena's work on conformal collider physics. A bunch of interesting uh, investigations of this energy flow operator actually coming um, online recently. And just as a, as a little aside, let me just tell you uh, something that we're working on, uh, which is a little bit outside of the flow of this talk, but I thought might be interesting. Um, so one thing that people do with this energy flow operator is they study energy energy correlations. That is, you imagine putting two idealized calorimeters separated by some distance delta r apart. And you try to understand as you take those calorimeters uh, closer and farther away from each other, um, how do those correlations change? Um, this traces itself back to the, to the, the late 1970s. Um, uh, and there's a long history in probing the collinear dynamics of QCD. So as you take these two uh, uh, idealized calorimeters close together, you uh, expose the uh, collinear singularity structure of QCD. And uh, measurements of this, for example, at Aleph have showed interesting deviations between uh, uh, data that's been measured and, uh, and, and Monte Carlo simulations. And there's fascinating theoretical challenges when I go to really small uh, angles with understanding that collinear limit. And one of the things that we were trying to do is to try to ask, now that we have uh, fantastic detectors uh, at the LHC and, and a new theoretical toolbox, uh, is it worth revisiting these energy energy correlators and seeing what type of new information we might be able to extract? And so just as a preview of work that I'm doing with uh, Patrick Kaminsky, Ian Moult, and uh, Wa Jingju, uh, we've been looking uh, at these uh, correlators in public data from the CMS experiment, where we take uh, uh, jets and calculate this energy energy correlator within within uh, jets and we can study what happens in the collinear limit where this uh, distance parameter goes to zero and uh, this to my knowledge is the first ever jet energy energy correlator plot from the LHC again made with public collider data and you can ask have we learned something about the small angle limit of QCD from this plot and uh, looking at this plot by itself there's nothing particularly dramatic in it uh, but if I replot the same data on a log-log scale, you actually see something quite fascinating, which with a question mark kind of seems to be indicating the QCD phase transition, but as realized in energy-energy correlator studies of jets, where at large angles, the fact that this uh, plot looks flat is basically telling you something about the quasi-scale invariance of QCD. So that makes sense. Uh, at the scale corresponding to the jet radius, you start to lose radiation outside of your jet. And then as, at a scale corresponding, roughly speaking, to the angular separation uh, uh, given by uh, lambda QCD, you see a dramatic transition from this kind of flat behavior to a different uh, power law. And this power law is basically uh, what you get if you just have random hadrons uh, with no correlation whatsoever. And so you can see in this plot the kind of transition from a partanic phase, where we have correlated radiation, to a hadronic phase, where we just have an uncorrelated gas of hadrons. And it's fascinating that one can see uh, this type of structure uh, by studying these uh, these energy energy correlators. And so we have a paper hopefully coming out sometime this year where we're studying not just two point correlators but three and four point correlators and uh, trying to show that experimentally one can actually get access to this energy flow information. Now for the purposes of the rest of this talk, uh, uh, the story that I just told isn't so important. Uh, what, what's more important is just understanding what this implies for the data structures that we're gonna be analyzing with, uh, 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 with, with a subsequent analysis. And so what this says is that instead of just having this uh, uh, picture of uh, this collection of points in momentum space, which in the machine learning community is called a point cloud, here, we want to think about jets not as ordinary point clouds, not just ordinary points in momentum space, but as weighted point clouds, where the energy information is the thing that provides that weighting. So this is an equivalent picture to this energy flow picture, um, just in a slightly different language. So instead of having these you know, particle tracks, instead I'm looking at, again, this kind of idealized calorimeter, and I'm keeping track of the direction that the energy is flowing, I'm keeping track of how much energy is flowing in a given direction, but I'm suppressing the things that are difficult to compute in perturbative uh, quantum field theory. That is, I'm suppressing unsafe charge information and unsafe flavor information. An equivalent way of talking about this set of energy weighted directions is equivalently talking about an energy density. So here I'm making a square slice of my detector and I'm making a picture where the dots correspond to an energy deposit the area of the dots tell, much how much, tell you how much energy is there, and the location of the dot tells you the direction that it's going. So this is, an, again, kind of an idealized calorimeter deposit. Uh, 
And I can think about what I'm trying to predict is I'm trying to predict this energy density. Um, and this is again, something that's well-defined even in massless gauge theories. Um, and this is something that we're gonna be using as the starting point for our subsequent analysis. So the answer to the first question of my talk is, okay, what is a collider event? So in general, a collider event is this point cloud, this collection of points in momentum space, but we're gonna suppress that information and we're gonna suppress it to only look at kind of a calorimeter like energy density. Um, I have some backup slides if you wanna know more about the relevance of this to the machine learning community, but this is our starting point. This is our data representation. And remarkably to me, this starting point, which is you know, relatively simple, turned out to give rise to a much richer structure than we might have uh, uh, anticipated from, from the outset. So let me just pause here and see if there's any questions about this particular way of capturing the information that I have in a collider event. Can I ask a really stupid question? Absolutely. Is this the way Root stores it? This is not the way that Root stores it, no. So uh, that in, a, uh, in an actual experimental analysis, you keep track of all the individual four vectors with all the charge information, the flavor information, all information you have. If you had you know, raw uh, experimental data, you would keep track of you know, individual track hits. So we're suppressing information. And we're suppressing information being motivated by the theory perspective that this energy flow is the thing that's most robust. And an interesting question you can ask is whether any of the things I'm gonna be talking about in the next part of the talk could be generalized to go beyond this picture, to which the answer is maybe, <laughs> uh, but we're gonna take this as our starting point. So we're losing information, but we're gonna gain a new geometric perspective. Aha, okay. So is this the way one of the uh, first level triggers would store it? It could be. Um, so if you only have a trigger that's based on calorimeter deposits and you have no information associated with charged particle tracks, then this is essentially uh, an idealized version of what a calorimeter based trigger would store. So if you only have calorimetry information, this is essentially what that's storing. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions before we continue? Okay, so um, a calorimeter, uh, sorry, a collider event is this energy flow density or energy density. And so if I'm trying to answer the question, when are events similar? Well, I wanna answer the question of, of when are energy flows similar? Uh, so let me try to show you this a little bit more visually. So here are now two collider events. So two collections of points in momentum space. And one's taken by the CMS experiment, one's taken by the Atlas experiment. And you'd like to quantify how close these are to each other. Now, again, this is not a question that we usually ask. What we usually do is we take a single collider event, we compute some property of it, we throw that into a histogram. Here, we're doing something different. Here, we're trying to take one event and another event and, and uh, assess the degree of similarity between the two of them. Now, one uh, type of similarity is closeness in spatial extent. So of course, these are on opposite sides of the LHC ring. So you might say they are distance 8.5 kilometers apart, uh, but that's clearly not a very useful notion of distance. Here we want to capture the fact that this multi-jet event and this multi-jet event have similar energy flow patterns. You can see kind of a collection of five-ish jets on one side, five-ish jets on the other side, maybe a little bit different on the other side, but there's some notion in which these two uh, events, even though they were taken at different times, um, they have some uh, a degree of similarity between them. And we want to quantify that degree of similarity. And we'd like to do this for you know, all possible pairings of, of events that I would collect at a collider. And here's where um, a fascinating thing that we learned uh, uh, from the computer vision community uh, comes into play, that if you're trying to compare at the level of these energy flows, how similar is the energy flows, that turns out to be very similar to analyzing how similar are two images, where now the pixel intensity of images is related to the energy density that I'm seeing in my calorimeter. So the name of this, um, which if you've heard it before, you know already know how powerful this is. And, and if you've never heard of this before, now I wanna tell you how powerful this concept is, not just in collider physics, but a variety of other uh, scientific domains. Um, and it goes under a variety of names, um, but the one I'll highlight here is the earth movers distance. So uh, uh, since uh, we're giving the seminar in Paris, uh, it's, uh, let me go back to the, the, the prehistory of this. Uh, a French mathematician, uh, uh, Monge in, in the 1780s, uh, uh, yes, that's 1780s, 
was uh, trying to answer uh, the following question. Uh, so my understanding is that in French, there's a separate word, uh, déblé, for a pile of dirt, and a different word, remble, for a trench where that dirt's going to go. And what Mange was trying to solve was the optimal way of moving one pile of dirt into a trough of dirt. Um, this was formalized more uh, by Wasserstein in, in the 1960s. So this is also sometimes called the Wasserstein distance. It's known in the computer graphics community uh, as this earth movers distance as an example of an optimal transport problem where I'm trying to find in all these cases, the minimum amount of work that is some amount of stuff times the distance that I'm trying to move it to make one distribution look like another distribution. So uh, uh, in this case, it's dirt. So I can imagine one distribution in blue, uh, the deble, and I wanna move this to this other distribution uh, in, in red. And I wanna quantify the notion of similarity between one versus the other. But really, anytime you have a data set that has an additive weight, uh, this could be the dirt in uh, this example here. We're going to be uh, treating this as energy in the particle physics uh, context. If you're doing dark matter uh, studies, this could be, you know, for example, dark matter densities uh, in, in dark matter halos. Um, uh, anytime you have some notion of weight and some notion of ground distance, uh, which in this case is literally the amount of distance on the ground you have to move the dirt, in the particle physics uh, context, that's going to be the rapidity azimuth distance. If you have a notion of additive weight and you have a notion of a ground distance, that gives rise to a distance between distributions. And because these energy flows can be thought about as energy densities and energy densities can be thought of as a type of distribution, um, that's why we can take this concept from computer graphics and import it into collider physics. And the way that we're gonna import it because we're moving energy around, we're gonna import it as the energy mover's distance. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to find the optimal way of rearranging one event, or in this case, we're gonna to specialize to just jets, uh, one jet and distort it into another. So uh, the way this energy mover distance works is I take, uh, let's say this red jet, and I wanna distort it into this blue jet, but I wanna do it in the way that's as, uh, 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 optimal as possible, that is, involves the least amount of effort. There's a penalty term associated with the cost to move energy. So I need to move energy from one configuration to another. So that's the theta, that's the, the ground distance that I'm moving it. This F is how much energy I'm moving from one place to the other. And that's represented by these gray lines here. And I'm again, trying to optimize over all possible Fs, but trying to find the minimum amount of energy times distance that I have. These distances are dimensionless. So that means that this EMD has units of giga electron volts. And then uh, something that we need to account for in the collider physics context is that two events might have different amounts of total energy. So there's a penalty term associated with uh, configurations that cost different amounts of energy or have different amounts of energy uh, in one place versus the other. So this is something that I can do. It gives me a pairwise distance between, uh, between events or a pairwise distance between jets. It should not be obvious to you why this is useful at all, uh, but this is something that I can compute. For every pair of jets, I can compute this object. And, and the reason why it uh, de deserves to be called a distance is because it satisfies the uh, uh, properties that are needed for a metric distance. So this is not metric in the general relativity sense. This is not a metric in the sense of a differential manifold. This is a metric in the sense of a metric distance that's used in computational geometry, a pairwise distance between points in some abstract space. And this metric satisfies the properties that you'd like for a distance. That is, it's always positive and only zero when the two configurations are identical. Um, and it satisfies the triangle inequality, meaning that if I summarize this red flow of energy as a single point shown as this red star, summarize this blue flow of energy uh, as this blue star, and then if I had a green flow of energy, uh, which would be this green star, that the distance between red and blue is always smaller than the sum of the distance of red to green and green to blue, which is to say uh, that you know there's no shortcut between red and blue. And the reason why I don't have any shortcuts is because, again, I'm trying to find the ultim optimal transport path. And if I try to transport red to green and green to blue, that's more expensive than just going directly from red to blue directly. Okay, so this is a notion of distance. Uh, it's not uh, obvious at all <laughs> that this is useful for, for collider physics. Uh, uh, David sent me a, a message in the chat about how computationally expensive is this. Um, and if I have n particles in one jet and n particles in the other, the kind of generic computational cost scales like n cubed, 
So it's a pretty expensive operation uh, to do. There's some really cool work uh, by the group in Santa Barbara that I'm highlighting here that they actually have found a computational speed up to do this much, much faster at the expense of kind of suppressing some information. Um, and so actually carrying out this computation uh, is, is a little bit expensive, but actually the, the cost per pairwise computation is not the, not the big cost. The real cost is the fact that if you have uh, K events, uh, you would need to calculate K square distances if you really wanted to triangulate the whole space. Um, and so uh, that's maybe not something that you wanna do. On the other hand, we're gonna see that these ideas have an interesting connection to cheaper computational tasks. And you'll see that in the, uh, in, in the third part of the talk. Okay, so let me just show you uh, uh, this cartoon, show it in, in video form. And let's see if Zoom, ah, Zoom is not working uh, the way that I want it to. So let me, uh, let me see. <laughs> e e exit from, uh, from full screen uh, mode and uh, show you this video in non full screen. I don't know why uh, it doesn't want to show in full screen mode, but here you can see this triangle, we have a red jet configuration, a green jet configuration, a blue jet configuration. And this movie in the middle is showing the distortion from one type of configuration to the other. Uh, the distances on the legs tell you how much energy times angle I have to do the distortion. And uh, this configuration has been chosen and represented uh, faithfully uh, such that you actually see that the triangle inequality is indeed satisfied. We talked to a reporter at MIT News about this and, and, and she said, oh, it's like kind of like building up your social network, you know, how close are you to someone else and you know, how close is someone else to someone else and you can actually like kind of thinking about like the geometry associated with uh, a, a graph of your neighbors and that's kind of what we're doing. Um, there was a, a recent paper highlighted here that actually took that idea um, uh, very seriously and is creating kind of graph like structures to analyze uh, collider data for evidence of new physics. Um, uh, but here, I just want to emphasize all we're doing is computing pairwise distances, but because it satisfies the property of being this metric, um, I can actually triangulate an abstract space and ask questions about that abstract space. And that's where we're gonna be going for the, uh, for the rest of this talk. Okay, so let me just show you an example of something that you can do once you have uh, this, this notion of distance. One of the most basic questions you can ask about a space is its dimensionality. And again, this is not something that we usually ask about in collider physics. What's the dimensionality of your data set? Uh, but here uh, we can compute something that's known as an intrinsic dimension where I don't need to have any coordinates. All I need to have is pairwise distances. And from those pairwise distances, I can figure out the geometry or at least the dimensionality uh, of my space. So the intuition for this as follows. Uh, let's say we're living in a city and we wanna understand what's the dimensionality of our city. Well, one way of doing it is asking how many neighbors do you have as a function of distance r. So if you're living on a city grid, then typically the number of neighbors that you have uh, grows uh, quadratically in the, the distance in city blocks that you move away from yourself. And you can invert this formula uh, to compute the dimensionality as the logarithmic derivative with respect to distance of the number of neighbors. Um, but actually the number of neighbors that you have depends a little bit on, on you know, what distance scale you probe things at. Uh, so if you're in a big high rise building, uh, actually on short distances, uh, you have neighbors that uh, grow cubically uh, with, with scale. And eventually as you start to go beyond the city limits, uh, your number of neighbors uh, grows less than quadratically. And that notion of a scale dependent distance um, uh, is, appears in other types of data sets. So here's an example of a spiral data set where if I zoom in really, really close, uh, then I have points, and if those points are you know, two meters apart from each other, this would be you know, socially distance. And here I see that my data set is zero dimensional. Uh, as I zoom out a bit, then I see that my, my points are kind of arranged in a two-dimensional pattern. So I'd say that my dimension at this scale is two-dimensional. As I zoom out further, I see that things are actually arranged more at a line. So that would give you a dimensionality of one. Zooming out even further, I would say that my dimensionality is two again, and then as eventually as I zoom all the way out, uh, this thing collapsed back down to a point and becomes zero dimensional. We can now do the same thing with our collider data. Again, I have collider data points. I'm measuring distance now, not with respect to physical distance R, but with respect to an energy scale, which I'll label as Q. And here is a plot of a QCD calculation uh, done just to leading logarithmic accuracy, showing this dimensionality as a function of scale. So here, what I'm doing is I'm doing a theory calculation of jets that are around 400 GeV. And if I'm at a distance scale corresponding to 400 GeV, my dimensionality is zero. Why is that? Well, that makes sense. Uh, my uh, jet corresponds to, at this distance scale, a single quark or gluon. 
Uh, and at that scale, a single quark or gluon, assuming that I'm pointing it all in the same direction, there are zero dimensions to that. It's just a single object. But as I go down an energy scale and I have the radiation that I expect from a parton shower picture, or eventually once I hit the hadronization scale, uh, we see that the dimensionality uh, increases as I go down in scale. And that means that this dimensionality uh, 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 goes up. So uh, as I go down in scale, the dimensionality goes up. And in fact, the way that it goes up depends on whether I have a sample of quark jets or gluon jets, where gluon jets carry more color charge compared to quark jets which is the reason why these blue curves are rising faster than the red curves. And in fact, this is kind of like the data science-y way of talking about uh, like a cusp anomalous dimension, if you want to think about it that way, where the, where the dimensionality depends on the strong coupling constant. It depends on the color factor. It depends logarithmically on the scale. Um, again, I'm not putting uh, uh, any uh, of kind of a theory language to this. This particular dimension is the dimension that I get just from a, a data science-y perspective. But nevertheless, it has a kind of intriguing uh, uh, a structure that that's reminds us of anomalous dimensions that we might see in a QCD context. So this is a QCD calculation uh, comparing a leaving logarithmic calculation in dotted to uh, a parton shower Monte Carlo generator shown um, in, in, in dashed. We can also do this with public data from the CMS experiment. And because public data is a mixture of quarks and gluons, we get a curve that lies somewhere between those two. And uh, we again see that if I isolate to uh, jets of a particular uh, transverse momentum, when I'm probing that jet at a scale corresponding to that transverse momentum, I have zero dimension. As I, when I probe it down at a, at a smaller distance, we see the emergence of the complexity of jets, again, now shown from this data science perspective. The fact that the black curve, uh, which is the data itself, and the orange curve, which is simulated data, are lying on top of each other uh, tells us that we're doing a, a good job <laughs> in terms of the QCD community, having Monte Carlo generators that do a good job of, of uh, capturing this behavior. Uh, and the fact that the blue curve, which is raw information, versus the orange curve, which is what happens when you go through a detector simulation, the fact that the orange curve is higher than the blue curve tells you that what a detector does primarily is smear out information. And smearing of information generates an increase in dimensionality. Why is that? Um, that's because if I had perfect resolution, uh, energies would be spikes. Uh, but when I have resolution, they get smeared out. So a spike corresponds to zero dimensions. The smearing out adds one dimension. And this is telling you that the smearing that I have from, uh, from my detector is roughly kind of a half dimension-ish uh, uh, in, in size. So that's kind of an interesting plot that we can get. And again, something that I don't know how to do using traditional um, collider physics data analysis techniques. So to answer this question, when are events similar? Uh, they are similar when they have small energy movers distance. And here's this formula again that I can compute. Uh, in the backup slides, I have more applications and more plots that I can show you if you're interested. But what we want to do for the rest of this talk is I want to um, uh, talk about the geometry that I get from this distance and how that geometry connects to other things that we've already familiar with in the collider physics context. Uh, so let me pause again here to see if there's any uh, uh, questions about this idea. And, and apologies in, in the uh, uh, in the background, you might be see, hearing uh, my, my wife who's running her law offices downstairs. Okay. Um, by the way, one, one question that you could ask is how unique is this form? Um, and actually there's many different notions of distance that one could come up with, but we're gonna see that this particular notion of distance is special from the collider physics perspective. Okay, so uh, now for the uh, last part of this talk, uh, asking the question, uh, what can be uh, geometrized? So what are the options for things that could be geometrized? So let me show you the master formula for collider physics. So this is the formula that uh, uh, you know anyone who wants to do theoretical predictions for colliders has to know how to interpret. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to compute cross sections for various processes. And from a theory perspective, what do we have to do? We have to do an integral over phase space of some amplitude squared uh, uh, and we have to have an observable in question that we're trying to uh, measure. And, uh, you know, you could ask of these four tasks that I want to do, cross sections, phase space, integration, calculating amplitudes and observables, which of these have a natural interpretation in this geometric language. And what I'm going to try to explain to you is that the notion of phase space 
turns out to have a pretty natural representation as manifolds in this abstract space triangulated by this energy movers distance. And there's a variety of observables that correspond to geometric constructs in this abstract space. Now, in terms of cross sections and amplitudes, this is maybe more speculative. So in the last part of the talk, I'll try to explain to you maybe one way of thinking about cross sections in this space. And in terms of amplitudes, it will turn out that the singularity structure of amplitudes um, is encoded in some way in the structure of phase space. Um, but I would say that uh, of, of, of these concepts, phase space and observables, are the ones that we have the cleanest uh, understanding about. And uh, what I'd, be, I'd love to figure out is how we could actually take uh, amplitudes and figure out a way of embedding them in this space. Um, but let me go step-by-step uh, uh, step and try to tell you a little bit more about phase space and observables and what their geometric interpretations are. So let's start by talking about manifolds um, in this space. So, and we wanna introduce uh, n-particle manifolds. So again, just to remind you, every collider event now, when I draw this dashed box, every collider event you should imagine as a point in an abstract space. And this space does not have coordinates. Uh, this space only has a triangulation. And uh, uh, so this makes it a little bit difficult to visualize, uh, but everything in this dashed box will be things where the distances are gonna be uh, uh, determined by this pairwise distance from the energy movers distance. So what is an n-particle manifold? Well, this Pn is just gonna be a set a set of all n particle configurations. So here is the space of all one particle configurations. And the space of all one particle configurations, these don't necessarily have to conserve energy momentum. It's just you know particles going in whatever direction. So that's one particle phase space. Um, and if I were to impose energy momentum conservation, uh, then we typically don't talk about one particle phase space. Um, uh, but here I'm gonna allow myself to talk about one particle phase space because it turns out to be related to uh, interesting geometric constructions that you might want to do with respect to observables. Now, one particle phase space is a strict subset of two particle phase space when viewed in this EMD language. So why is that the case? Well, for two particle configurations, so here's a bunch of two particle configurations, um, and I'm going to draw this as this kind of abstract manifold P2. But if I take one of those particles and I take it to have zero energy, then from the perspective of the energy flow, that will be just equivalent to a one particle configuration. Similarly, if I take two particles and I put them exactly on top of each other, from the perspective of the energy flow, I can't tell that those are, are two particles anymore. The, the a calorimeter can't tell if there's two particles exactly on top of each other going into some calorimeter cell. And so uh, these n-particle manifolds are nested where, for example, the two-particle manifold uh, is a superset of the one-particle manifold, or more generally, the n-particle manifold is a superset of the n minus one particle manifold, and they're connected by soft collinear limits. So again, I can you know, fill this out for the three particle manifold, the four particle manifold, the five particle manifold. And these are manifolds uh, in, the, in, the, in the technical meaning of a manifold that is they're locally equivalent to Euclidean space, despite the fact that this general space in, in this dash box uh, does not have a Euclidean coordinate system. Uh, you have to nest a bunch of different Euclidean coordinate systems in order to, for example, describe this uh, extremely high multiplicity uh, of, of event here shown in blue. So um, this is uh, how phase space now looks like uh, in this uh, energy movers distance picture. And the reason why this is a powerful concept uh, is because of these soft and collinear limits. And in particular asking the question, when are events exactly the same? So again, events are exactly the same from this energy movers distance picture when the energy flows are exactly the same and energy flows are unchanged by infinitesimal soft and collinear emissions. So if I take a jet configuration and I add a zero energy particle, or if I take a jet configuration and I take one particle and I split it exactly uh, in two, uh, that doesn't change the energy flow. So energy flow is unchanged by infinitesimal soft and collinear emissions, or what we would say formally is we'd say that energy flow is something that's infrared and collinear safe. And what's exciting about this from thinking about this geometric picture is that this means that infrared divergences in some sense live together. So if I have a virtual diagram of n particles with some loop there, and then I consider the real emission diagram that has the classic collinear, sing uh, collinear singularity structure and soft singularity structure of QCD in there, this real emission becomes singular when I go to the soft and collinear limits. But when I go to the soft and collinear limits, that's exactly when the n plus one body phase space degenerates down onto the n body phase space. So when viewed as this abstract space as a whole, 
real and virtual divergences live exactly on top of each other. They can't be separated. And because of this, we can actually give a new formal definition of infrared and collinear safety. So infrared and collinear safety, roughly speaking, is when uh, you have quantities that are calculable in perturbative quantum field theory. And it turns out that this notion of calculability in perturbative quantum field theory is continuity in this abstract space. So to remind you what continuity is, so continuity is saying that if I have an observable O and I say that I have uh, two different configurations where the observable O differs by some amount less than epsilon, uh, that there is uh, uh, a ball in this bigger space uh, 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 with radius delta, such that when two configurations in this ball of radius delta, uh, if they're within that radius delta, then they'll be within this radius r uh, for that observable o. And so things that are continuous uh, are things that have this uh, smoothness property to them. Um, and it turns out with an asterisk that I'm happy to explain uh, uh, in Q&A, uh, infrared and collinear safety and continuity in this EMD-induced space are the same thing. And there's actually been interesting uh, uh, discussions in the literature about the exact definition of infrared and collinear safety. And those different uh, conversations in the literature about the exact definition of IRC safety turn out to correspond to different notions of continuity that you might have um, with the, uh, uh, the kind of weakest notion of continuity uh, being the one that uh, uh, corresponds most closely to what we mean by calculability and perturbative quantum field theory. So again, I'm, I'm happy to talk about more of this uh, uh, in the Q&A. Um, but uh, the kind of the punchline that I, that I want you to take from this is that this energy mover's distance seems to define the natural geometry for massless gauge theories. These type of soft and collinear singularities are a ubiquitous feature of massless gauge theories. And the EMD seems to want to unify them in terms of the geometric structure. What I don't know how to do is I don't know how to define amplitudes in this space. Why is that? Well, amplitudes have a fixed particle number if I'm doing talking about amplitudes uh, relative to a Fox space. Whereas this EMD has a more flexible notion of multiplicity uh, where things are connected by these uh, various soft and collinear limits. And furthermore, not only do I not know how to define amplitudes in this space, I don't really know what it means to integrate in this space. But again, there seems to be a hint that this is the kind of right language to talk about massless gauge theories. And it'd be very interesting to figure out whether there's a way of making more formally precise uh, uh, these concepts. Uh, concepts, because that might allow us to do calculations that might be more difficult to do in the traditional Feynman diagrammatic approach. Uh, so so uh, David's asking a, a question about, is there a connection to coherent states? And I do, so there's, there's a superficial connection to coherent states, where coherent states are uh, multi-particle states, um, but they're multi-particle quantum states. Whereas here, I'm taking the amplitude squared first, and these energy flow configurations uh, in the space space integral that I'm doing um, are uh, defined not on the quantum states, uh, but defined on, if you want to think about it this way, on the density matrices. So it's not exactly the same thing, it seems like. And it would be wonderful to figure out, can we kind of come up with a, a more density matrix -y version of the S matrix? And maybe that's the kind of way that I should be thinking about this. Uh, but there's definitely a superficial connection to coherent states in the sense that coherent states don't have a fixed particle multiplicity. But again, uh, coherent states are ones that have a well-defined quantum mechanical structure. Here, I'm suppressing quantum mechanical interference by focusing on the energy flow. The energy flow doesn't know whether I have quarks or gluons or whatever going in. So I lose things like uh, the color structure or charge structure. Uh, nevertheless, that's what you need to do uh, in the context of infrared and collinear safety. Infrared and collinear safety tells you that you need to be able to synthesize uh, states that have different quantum numbers. Uh, and it's the integration over those states that gives you uh, the cancellation of divergences. So exactly making this connection is not, uh, not, not, not so clear uh, at the moment. Uh, but it'd be wonderful to make that connection more clear. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you about phase space. Um, what about for observables? So observables, we usually think as functions living on phase space. Here, I want to give you a different way of thinking about observables and observables as geometric constructions in this abstract space. So here again, in my abstract space, I have one event, and then I have some manifold M that corresponds to a set of events. And if I have one event and I have a set of events, I can define a distance of closest approach between that event and that manifold. Um, so this is what an experimentalist might call an impact parameter. So the impact parameter between uh, this event and, and, and the set of events, that defines an observable. 
So again, the EMD itself is a function of two configurations. But if I look at a manifold, so a set of configurations, and I look at the minimum distance uh, as given by the EMD from my event of interest in blue to this manifold in red, that gives me a notion of observables. And it turns out that there's a variety of observables that actually have this geometric form. One of the classic ones uh, 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 is thrust. And thrust in words is asking the question about how diget-like is an event. So here I have an event from Aleph and I wanna know, okay, is this Aleph event diget-like? Well, one way to quantify that is to say, let me look at the manifold of all possible two particle configurations. I'm drawing this manifold as a ring because there's some kind of symmetry or topology to all possible two particle configurations uh, back to back having kind of like a ring-like structure if I wanna think about it topologically. So this manifold of all part back to back two particle configurations, uh, uh, this is a manifold that I can draw in this space. And the distance of closest approach of this event to that manifold is a quantity that I can study. And that quantity that I can study is basically thrust. So this little t uh, is a function of an event. It takes, again, the minimum distance between my event of interest and a two particle back to back configuration. This T here, suitably manipulated, is thrust, like the exact same thrust that Aleph measured in the other LEP experiments and previous experiments and subsequent experiments have measured. And it's kind of interesting to look at the difference of the form of, of this defined in EMD language, where there's a minimum structure versus what was defined, uh, for example, by Eddie Fari in the 1970s of thrust as a maximum over, uh, over axes. And this maximization over the thrust axis and this minimization in terms of distance of closest approach turn out to be uh, identical. One has to do with the, uh, the uh, manifest geometry of collider data. This one has to do with this more emergent geometry uh, and this notion of manifolds and points and, and uh, impact parameters. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, that actually this notion of, uh, of observables this way has already been with us uh, in the past. Uh, what can we do that's new uh, now that we have this geometric idea? So one thing that we can do is we can now ask different types of questions. So thrust is trying to answer the question, how diget-like is an event? Maybe we want to go in the other direction and ask how isotropic is an event? And so this is work with uh, Carrie Cicerotti, who's a, a Harvard graduate student. And uh, so again, we have our point, our event, which is a point in the space. And then I can think about an isotropic configuration uh, which also corresponds to a point in this space. Uh, there's only one uh, uh, fully isotropic configuration. And the distance between that point and that, that uniform configuration, that gives you a way of quantifying the degree of isotropy. And this degree of isotropy is clearly different than thrust. So being isotropic is not just being far away from the two particle manifold. Being isotropic means that you're close to the uniform configuration. And what's really interesting about this notion of isotropy, which again is just the simple EMD between an event and the uniform configuration, is that it has a huge dynamic range in terms of capturing degrees of isotropy. As I go from a ordinary QCD diget like event to uniform 10 body phase space, 25 body phase space, 50 body phase space, uh, you can see that there's actually well separation between these different configurations. And even this 50 body phase space is not uniform. It doesn't get you down to an isotropy value of zero. Uh, because of the fluctuations in the amount of energy that you have. Um, and so this is a really interesting observable um, and uh, uh, Carrie has been using this to study actually uh, interesting beyond the standard model Hidden Valley like scenarios that give you give rise to isotropic configurations. And this is a type of observable that's very sensitive to those types of uh, isotropic configurations. Um, so as I advertised, it turns out that a huge <laughs> number of ideas can be translated into this geometric language. So I mentioned already infrared and collinear safety is smoothness or continuity in the space of events. Event shapes like thrust um, and sphericity turn out to be correspond to distances between events to manifolds. Jet algorithms turn out to taking an event configuration, projecting it down to the end particle configuration and the location of closest approach is a way of defining a jet algorithm. Jet substructure observables, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this one in just a second. And pilot mitigation, I'll come back to this in a second, but these also uh, have uh, geometric interpretations. And so I, I call this hidden, the hidden geometry of particle collisions because this geometric uh, intuition has guided us actually, even though we didn't have this uh, more formal language to describe it. So let me uh, show you this in, uh, uh, in uh, 
some examples very quickly uh, and then uh, get to my get to my coda. So uh, I'll, I'll go through this uh, uh, quickly here. So uh, n subjectiveness is an example of a, of a jet substructure observable uh, used almost for almost a decade uh, that I developed with Ken Van Tilburg in around uh, 2011. And people used to make fun of us for this formula <laughs> uh, that looked kind of complicated, you know, a, a double minimum structure, a sum over energies, bunch of angles. And, and this is something that uh, uh, characterizes the degree to which an, a jet is composed of n subjects. Um, and so this is something uh, that I can use to uh, characterize the topology of these configurations. And this formula turns out to be exactly the distance of closest approach between a point and the n particle manifold. Um, and so uh, uh, even though that formula looked complicated in some sense in retrospect, uh, it was the simplest thing that we could have come up with for describing how n particle like a configuration is, we'll just ask how close it is to the n particle manifold. Um, you can do other things, as I mentioned, jet algorithms, uh, uh, jet recombination. Um, let me skip just in the interest of time. You can also do pilot, pilot mitigation this way as uh, finding the geodesic path away from uh, uh, uniform configurations. So let me just skip this in the interest of time. Um, uh, and, and just say, you know, what can be geometrized? A bunch of concepts from collider physics and quantum field theory in the past half century have a, have a, a mapping in this way. Um, and it comes from two things. One, that infrared and collinear safety and energy flow are very closely connected. And energy flow has this natural notion of distance given by this EMD. So it's not so surprising that infrared and collinear safe ways of uh, uh, interacting with energy flow will uh, map onto this geometric language. Um, so Diego's asking a question about the energy movers distance uses energies and momenta, but not charge, spin, and other quantum numbers. So that's correct. And the question is, are these pieces of information not included because they are discrete? Um, and if they were continuous, could they have been included? So it's not just because they're discrete. Um, you can have a notion of distance even if you have discrete quantities. So it's not that. Um, the reason why they're not showing up here is because um, those are things that are not uh, easily computable uh, in the context of perturbative quantum field theory. That is, if I start off with a configuration of uh, let's say a single quark, a single quark carries, let's say an up quark carries charge two thirds. But if I have a splitting of, of that quark to a quark and a gluon, now the part of that uh, two thirds that's carrying energy is decreased. And now I have a gluon that's emit, being emitted that carries charge zero. So even though the total charge is something that is of course well-defined, uh, but the total color charge is just zero because we're, we're, we're starting off with color singlet states. The flow of charge is something that I don't know how to compute in quantum field theory, either because it's uh, uh, infrared unsafe or collinear unsafe. Um, so that's the reason why I'm not including them here. Um, and uh, so David's asking, what about energy weighted charge and flavor? And you can go through all those various energy weightings and you can convince yourself that there is no energy weighting that is simultaneously uh, soft safe and collinear space safe. So if you put an energy weighting in there, uh, then you have a trade-off between whether you want to maintain soft sensitivity, soft, soft safety, or, or collinear safety. And if you have a notion of energy-weighted flow that's, uh, uh, that's safe under both, that would, I'd be thrilled because if you could do that, then we could actually build a notion of distance that included uh, charge or even spin information. Um, uh, good. And then the question is, you can do a Frisciani style cone though, can't you? So. That turns out to be really, really subtle. Uh, and the answer is yes, under certain circumstances, you can do kind of a Frisciani style uh, algorithm. But even there, you get uh, into subtleties having to do with photon splitting to an E plus E minus pair. And uh, uh, I'm not aware of a fully robust uh, definition that allows me a notion of distance that works in all circumstances. Um, but it would be awesome if we had one, because if we had one, we could uh, now start to talk about unsafe quantities in a, in a more rigorous way. Okay, so, uh, uh, so I, I've talked a little bit slower than I was expecting, uh, but uh, let me know, go now uh, quickly through this, uh, through this uh, grand finale, which I can do uh, quite quickly. So if, if people need to leave, I understand. Um, uh, we started a little bit late, so I don't feel too bad about doing this. But let me end by now uh, trying to answer the question about how far does this rabbit hole go? So let me re-give the whole talk, but now in a faster form. Uh, 
And then hopefully uh, your brain is going to see a connection uh, that will take us one further step down the rabbit hole. So we started off with the manifest geometry of collider data, where we had directions in my detector and angular distances given by azimuth. Um, and here's some equations of how you can do this uh, in four vector notation for defining distances and, uh, 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 and uh, so de defining directions and, and distances. Um, so then what we did is we added the notion of weight and we said that particles carry an energy weighting and energy weighted directions have a geometry, uh, 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 a manifest geometry in terms of their angular distances apart. But we can also take this information and summarize that into a single point, a single event, and then take this direction space distribution and now go into event space. So now everything is uh, uh, points in this space. So my events are single points. And now I can use uh, this energy movers distance to compute pairwise distances between those points. And uh, as we've discussed already, I'm suppressing information. So I'm suppressing charge and flavor and spin information. Uh, but again, this gives me a well-defined notion of distance. And now you can ask, can I do this again? Okay, so now you have to think about events. And I want to take those events and I want to apply a weight to them. So what's the most natural notion of weight that I can think about for an event? Well, the idea that we came up with was that an event carries with it a cross-section. So uh, an event is weighted by the cross-section to produce it. So I have a variety of different event configurations. I'm trying to show them with these stars as being like, you know, different number of jet multiplicities or something like that. Um, and each one of those configurations has a weight. And if I have a set of weighted events, then what do I have here? Well, I would argue that what you have here is a theory. Um, if I give you a theory, I give you the standard model of particle physics then what can you predict? You can predict what are all the possible events that I can create with what type of weights. Now, again, I'm suppressing charge and flavor information. And there's a very interesting formal question about if I only study correlators of the stress energy tensor and I don't actually study any correlators involving charge, uh, uh, is that enough to uniquely specify the theory at the Lagrangian level? So, so I'm not gonna weigh into that, uh, but, but let's say, uh, I, maybe I should have put quotes around the theory. Um, but now I have a theory. A theory is a prediction for all the cross sections for various different types of, of, of events. And now here's the rabbit hole. Now I can take that now into theory space. Again, a theory is cross section weighted event configurations. And just like I had the energy movers distance, I can define a cross section movers distance by how much cross section do I have to move to distort one theory into another. A distance between theories just like the energy movers distance gave rise to concepts like n subjectiveness or n jettiness, this cross section movers distance, I could like have things like k eventiness. To what extent is a theory describable by having k event configurations? That's kind of a, again, a, a quite deep rabbit hole <laughs> that we've taken ourselves down. But this is kind of fascinating. You know, I can imagine one uh, uh, theory being the theory of the standard model, another theory being n equals four super Yang Mills. And you can ask to what extent are the event configurations I would get from a conformal theory, or maybe I need to make it quasi-conformal to, to make this more precise, uh, how far apart are they? How much would I have to distort the standard model in order to make it look like um, a quasi-conformal field theory? Um, or maybe I have the standard model and some uh, extension beyond the standard model that has a, um, uh, a new particle in it. You could ask, well, how much uh, do my event uh, predictions, my cross-section predictions, how much do they change? So this is a fascinating, uh, uh, type of emergent geometry that takes us even deeper than where we were before. And you can ask, is there any possibility that this is even relevant? I mean, we already talked about the computational cost of computing this EMD. This is even more computationally expensive. Um, and the surprise for me is that it turns out that this idea was an idea that we already had, <laughs> remarkably, uh, uh, in the context of heavy ion physics. And so this is the last thing that I want to tell you. Um, so here's an example of a lead-lead collision, collision where uh, I have not just uh, a jets, but jets that have been quenched by their propagation through the quark-gluon plasma. And you can ask, does this notion of a distance between theories, does this actually help me understand uh, the formation process or, or the, the, the quenching process of jets as they go through the QGP? And the answer is, is yes. And again, we came to this uh, from a different perspective, but let me give you the geometric idea. So the geometric idea is that I have one theory 
which is QCD in vacuum. So here are all the jet configurations that I would get from QCD uh, in a vacuum configuration. And then I have my theory prime, which is QCD jets, how they look like when the jets are propagated through the medium. And I'm trying to represent the distortion of, of those jets. And I can calculate this cross section movers distance uh, as the optimal transportation plan to map between in medium jets and vacuum jets. And once I have this optimal transportation plan, then I have a way of transporting from one configuration to another and kind of following a geodesic from one theory to the other theory. And following that geodesic from one theory to the other theory turns out to be work that I did with Jasmine Brewer and uh, Gera uh, Milano, where we defined a way of actually characterizing uh, this quenching via what we called a quantile procedure. And it turns out that this quantile procedure in a certain limit uh, corresponds to exactly figuring out the cross-section movers distance between uh, one theory and, and the other. Um, so uh, uh, this, this, this is a kind of a hint that this theory space might actually be something that's uh, useful for us uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the future. Um, so uh, with that, let me just give you a quick summary of this talk and then open it up for, to further questions. Um, uh, so what is a collider event? Uh, a collider event is an unordered set of particles that describes the energy flow away from the collision point. And uh, if you're interested, I can tell you about the relevance of that in the machine learning context. Um, here we focused on what a machine learning person would call unsupervised machine learning. Um, and uh, uh, answering the question, when are events similar? Turns out to be a type of unsupervised learning task. Um, and they're similar when they're close in the geometric space triangulated by this energy movers distance. And I have more plots and such about this EMD in the, in the backups. And then, you know, what could be uh, geometrized? Uh, well, many concepts and techniques in, collider, in, in, in uh, quantum field theory and collider physics from the last half century have this geometric interpretation. Um, and in the backup, I can tell you a little bit more about this concept of infrared and collinear safety and how that uh, uh, sh showed up in, the, uh, in this geometric language. And uh, what I'm hoping for is that now that we have this new uh, geometric intuition, that they, this might give us interesting guideposts for what we can do in collider physics for the, uh, for the next half century. Um, so with that, uh, I'll, I'll conclude. Uh, so uh, a, a, a fast, dense talk. Uh, hopefully you found something uh, in this that, that piqued your interest. Uh, looking forward to taking your questions and uh, I'll make sure to post the slides uh, uh, once I go offline. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Jesse. So uh, yeah, I okay. learned uh, not one, but two French words today. So <laughs> it's already something, but yeah, everything what I said about the originality of the approach was was, was confirmed by, by your talk. Uh, is there okay. questions? Yeah, if you have a question, the best way is to, put, to, to raise your hand, but if you don't want to search for a button, you can just unmute and ask the question as well. Um, so I don't, yeah, there is a question from Gregory Swaye, please, Gregory. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Gregory. Good to see you. Yeah, well, well, good, to hear, good to hear you as well. Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to see each other soon enough. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, yeah, the, there were even some details I hadn't heard before. Uh, so, uh, yeah, essentially you started by saying that this distance was applied in the context of distance between images. Yeah. Images can have multiple colors. Can you get into it? Can that help you in some way into going to, I don't know, you, you were mentioning something like photons and electrons. Yeah. The minute you, you, you mix, uh, say, different type of particles, you might want to use a concept which is similar to what people do with different colors. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, so, so let, let's make it really concrete. I have an electron. I have an electron going in some direction. And then I swap out that electron. And let's say the electron has um, uh, 100 GeV of, of uh, energy. And I swap out that electron for a muon, but going in exactly the same direction with the exactly the same energy. So what is the distance between those configurations? From the perspective of the energy flow, the energy flows are identical up to the mass effects. Uh, but let's, let's ignore the mass of the muon for a second. So, so, the, so, the, so the, from the... From the perspective of the energy flow, those are identical configurations. But then you say, oh, come on, it's electronness versus muonness. And so now I need to assign a number in units of GeV for swapping out an electron and a muon. And uh, what do you want that number to mean? It, may, maybe you want to say the exchange rate between an electron and a muon is uh, you know, 500 GeV. So every time you want to swap an electron for a muon, you have to pay a 500 GeV uh, energy cost. Or maybe you want to say it's some other number, or maybe you want to say it's an infinite distance between those. 
And I think the challenge there is that it just becomes ambiguous of what you mean by that distance. And that ambiguity is one that we don't have a, uh, uh, an analog in, in, uh, uh, in collider physics right now. Now, let me just actually highlight something which I, I glossed over. Um, what about the ambiguity between the cost to move energy and the cost to create energy? Isn't there an ambiguity there as well? And the answer is yes, there's an ambiguity. The cost to create energy has units of giga electron volts. The cost to move energy naively is giga electron volts times radians. Of course, radians, you can argue whether that has units or not, but, but we divided by this parameter R. And, it, and so I, I, I brush this all under the rug, but this parameter R turns out to be exactly the jet radius in a jet algorithm. And so we already had a language to talk about this parameter that, that, that governs the relationship between the cost of move energy and the cost of create energy that turns out to be related to yeah, a jet and, radius and, parameter. In a similar spirit, I guess you could put an exponent to theta over R and that would give you this, the equivalent of the subject index of the exponent parameter. Yes, and good. And that turns out to correspond to, in the name of Wasserstein metrics, that would correspond to the P Wasserstein metrics. So beta equals two, which we use all the time for jet substructure, that turns out to be the same as the two Wasserstein metrics. Okay. Yeah, so there's a whole formal language uh, having to do with that as well. But now if you want to do electrons versus muons, you would have to have an additional term here, the cost to switch an electron to a muon. And just by dimensional analysis, you would need to have some new energy scale in the problem. And that's where I don't know what the right answer is okay. to be. And that's why, and so I would love for someone to tell me, yes, this is the, the well-defined notion of how to, how to compare energy and charge and spin and all that. Uh, but my, my sense is that this is a really a formal field theory question to begin with. Um, and the formal field theory meaning of this R is, you know, what is the radius parameter that you need to regulate um, collinear divergences? And, and it may be that that similar type of, of thinking could be helpful in the flavor context about like, how do I have an infrared and collinear safe notion of flavor? Maybe there's some thing in, in, in that direction that could help me figure out what that parameter should look like. Okay. Yeah, maybe if I can ask another kind of unrelated, unrelated question. Yeah. You had that work in the past, or well, a few years ago, about energy flow polynomials acting yeah. essentially as a base of infrared and collinear safe observables. Yeah. Is there an equivalent or connection with this kind of geometric picture? Um, uh, yes. Uh, so, who, who's who's the who's the star of the show? Let, 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 let's 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 be clear about this. Um, the the star of the show is just this concept of energy flow, and and, and that's exactly where I'm coming from. That's that's yeah. exactly, you you start from something like that, and it seems to me that you go into two kind of different directions, and so they have to be connected. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so this is so this is the star of the show. Energy flow is the star of the show. What was done in the 1970s was to do pairwise energy correlators. Mm -hmm. What we did with our energy flow polynomials is come up with um, extending new, this. Well, no, not extending this. Um, coming up with observables uh, that you would compute, so that for each event you would have just one number. What we did in the machine learning context with energy flow networks was to have a learnable representation mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. that, and then somehow there's this new thing that we're doing with saying, oh, now I can compute uh, 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 the, this, this optimal transport. But where the optimal transport went was not to the energy flow polynomials where the optimal transport went somehow was it went in this direction of, of n subjectiveness. And so the energy flow polynomials were trying to get away from n subjectiveness, trying to get away from this minimization step. But somehow this energy mover's distance likes minima because of this optimality uh, okay. uh, feature of it. So energy flow is the star of the show and it's gone in these two different directions. It's gone in this kind of energy flow polynomial, energy flow network, energy flow moment direction, which is a whole nother talk, but then separately this geometric picture and they don't quite want to go back together yet, uh, but they must somehow be related because they have the same fundamental primitive. Um, and but but you know I, I I haven't yet figured out that uh, that that connection, um, other th other than to to point out that the same singularity structures that are regulated by n jettiness or n sub jettiness are also regulated by these energy flow polynomials. Um, yeah. But but th that that's that's true of any any infrared and collinear safe observable that you might want to come up with that's sensitive to n prong structures. So it's not special in that regard. Yeah.
Yeah, and, and actually I had a last question. Yeah. Uh, so th there's lots of work in the Javion community about, uh, about, the, about correlations and flows, energy flows as well, uh, mm -hmm. elliptic flow and so on and so forth. Uh, and again, there's the, question, the, there's the natural question whether there is uh, a way to interpret these kind of things in, a, in this geometric picture. Yeah, so, so uh, absolutely yes. And there's two different strategies that you might want to, um, might want to pursue. So strategy number one uh, is like this event isotropy picture, where if you're trying to calculate, uh, compute something like the ellipticity of an event, okay, that you, that you would figure out a generalization of this to basically say, how close am I to various elliptic configurations as opposed to the fully isotropic configuration? So that's, that's one direction um, that uh, you could pursue. Um, and then the, um, the other direction uh, is uh, this, more uh, distortion uh, perspective, where you say, I want to study flow by asking, how does it distort relative to some baseline? And the thing that I really like about this, this, um, this distance between theories is that it allows you to study deformations even though you never see the deformation process directly. So you only see the vacuum QCD and in medium QCD, you don't see actually how you deformed from one to the other, um, unless you have a Monte Carlo generator. And yet, despite that, you can use this notion of optimality to get a proxy for that distortion. Um, okay. And so it may be that like thinking about not in, in the jet context, but let's say just for underlying event, the distortion between minimum bias configurations on the proton proton context versus you know more flow like configurations um, yeah, either in 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 uh, you know P lead or, or lead lead. Yeah, that or, or, or jet events, or, or in the jet context, which is what I did with Jasmine and 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 Garen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for the answers. I should probably let other people ask us some more. Okay. Thanks, Gregory. <laughs> thanks, Jesse. Thanks. Uh, is there more more questions? So I don't see. Maybe I can profit and uh, ask one uh, last question for, from yeah. myself. Yeah. So, what can you give to, to a guy like me who wants to connect uh, this this work to, to some Lagrangians? For example, I want to know whether, whether there is some four quark operator, or maybe a simpler even question: if there is some violation of C or P uh, symmetry. So, yeah. what can you give me? Good. So the question is whether this notion of distortion helps you think, or let me, let me back up just to this theory space, helps you think in a new way about what happens in your EFT when you add an operator. So um, here I'm talking about the emergent geometry that I get from this EMD, but you can imagine other types of geometric structures. And if you start thinking about the standard model as a point and deformations of the standard model as moving in some space, but then thinking about that space as having a geometry to it, that seems to be useful. Of course, we talk about parameter spaces all the time, right? So, so we, we talk about parameter space where we say, you know, I have, you know, this particular operator and this particular operator, and we and we make a 2D plot where we, you know, make ellipses of confidence intervals and all that. So, so we so there we we do talk about uh, spaces that have coordinates. Here the question is, is there a notion of distance that's useful that may step either back away from coordinates or really goes very, very high dimensional. But nevertheless, I can find projections uh, of that high dimensional space that are, are, are intuitive. Um, so, uh, you know, this, an example is, is shown here. So this is the picture that I showed at the beginning of the talk. You know, as I mentioned, this is like some high dimensional fractal at, at a scale of 10 GeV, like five dimensional space that I'm trying to project down to 2D. If I'm looking at some EFT that has you know 60 parameters, and I want to somehow visualize like how does how does my data constrain, you know that, that parameter space? How can I go from this really giant space down to something that I might be able to project down to 2D or, or, or learn lessons from in 2D? The way that that's that's enabled is by thinking in this geometric language. And in this particular case, this is a, a data projection method called t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding that tries to project things down while preserving uh, notions of distance. So my suspicion is that there's a notion of, of distance in effective field theory space that's useful and a distance between Lagrangians um, that's useful. 
and that will be able to use that that abstract notion of of, of distance in a, in, a, in a useful way. But it's going to be different than what I showed here. But that's the thing to maybe ask about is like, as we go forward and as we start, you know, collecting monstrous amounts of data, and we want to actually ask what are the implications for that. No one wants to stare at, or no one knows how to interpret, you know, bounds on on sixty EFT operators. How do we demonstrate uh, the the power of our of our our constraints in that high dimensional space in a way that's more interpretable um, and and projected down to this low dimension? So that, that that's probably what I would give you.